Well, good evening to you all. It's indeed a blessing for me to be able to bring you a portion of God's Word this evening. I pray that it will be a blessing to you as well, and most of all, I pray that it will be a honoring to our great and glorious God. And now, it should not be a surprise to many of you that we are going to be looking at a passage out of the Gospel of Luke this evening, as Duane uh, almost shocked me into a heart attack this morning. But this morning in our 180 degree Sunday school class, we finished our 190th lesson out of this remarkable gospel, and we're only in the middle of chapter 22, which is about the events that surround the death of our Lord on a Thursday evening of, of Passion Week. Absolutely stunning portion of scripture, but that's not what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to be looking at the last 12 verses of Luke chapter 16, so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. And we'll be looking at it, verses 19 through 31. This is one of those sections in the Gospel of Luke that's unique to Luke. And it's a very, very powerful portion of Scripture. It's a story that Jesus told that's unforgettable. And even the casual student of the Bible knows it's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a story about hell. And we could come up with several suggestive titles like how do you think you're going to heaven and end up in hell? Or we could say a man who was shocked to find himself in hell, and those would be appropriate. But if I were to put a title on this, I would just simply say that this is a personal testimony of what it's like to be in hell. A personal testimony of what it's like to be in hell. And let me say at the beginning, this is not a popular subject. And the reason for this, that hell for the overwhelming majority of people has been greatly minimized and is actually nothing more than a swear word for most people. But also, and this is even more of a heartbreak, the vast majority of so-called Christian churches, very little is said about hell. Very little. Because obviously it's not a popular subject. I remember some 36 years ago as I was teaching a WANA class in this church, some parent was very critical of the teaching about sin and hell because it was scary to the children. Tragically, when we think about eternity, most people who die think they will automatically go to heaven, go to a, quote, better place. That is the feeling, and consequently, there is very little, if any, thought of people going to hell. I've attended many funerals, and they are becoming increasingly frequent as I get older. And usually at these celebration of life services, we hear about the person who's died, and that's fine. But rarely do we hear anything about the soul-saving, life-giving, life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. That salvation that God has provided through his son. And even in many so-called Bible-believing churches, there's often no clear gospel message presented. And what a better time to preach that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. To save sinners from going to hell. My mother used to say about traditional funeral services that the officiating minister or pastor would just get up and preach that person right into heaven. And what that sadly means is that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be brutally surprised when they go to hell. They're going to be in total shock, and they ended up in a place of torment instead of being in the glories of heaven. And every time someone dies that I know that probably isn't a child of God, I think about my great aunt. It was my mother's aunt. And she belligerently, her entire life, antagonistically, refused to even hear the gospel message. And on her deathbed, as my mother was pleading with her, pleading with her to trust in Christ, she rejected. And her last words, as she entered into eternity, were, what is that terrible stench? And we, of course, do not know what she was experiencing. Possibly, that would be what she was experiencing, that hell, the fiery torment in hell. 
And that's what we're going to be talking about in this story that Jesus tells primarily to the Pharisees. And as Dwayne talked to us this morning, the Pharisees were the religious leaders. They were the, I call them the religious high muckety mucks. The religious elite, they thought. And this story is about a certain rich man. He's the main character. He's a religious man. And he would be recognized as that in the context of the story, story as Jesus is telling it. Because he's thinking, in, the thinking in that day among Jews particularly the Pharisaic Jews, is that if you were wealthy, that means you have been blessed by God. And if you were poor, that meant you were being cursed by God. In other words, they had their own prosperity religion in those days. Now, we need to set the context. You might look back in chapter 15 and verse 2 for just getting us in there. And, and this is where both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And the, and the thing was that sinners, the outcasts, everybody were coming to Jesus to hear him, and he was talking to them. He was even fellowshipping with them, in a sense. And these religious muckety-mucks said, wow, how can that be? And then Jesus, of course, told him three parables in, in that chapter. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the seeking father who seeks after two lost sons. And then in chapter 16, verse 1, Jesus was also saying to, his, to the disciples, and he gives the parable of the, I call it the shady but shrewd supervisor or steward, and, of course, the Pharisees were also listening to this. And then Luke takes us right into verse 14 of chapter 16. And it, this is the key here. Now, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And, again, you, you see their convenient theology, which accommodated their wealth, prosperity, religion. The more money you had, the more you were blessed by God. Loving money, pursuing money, is like loving God and pursuing blessing. That was their view. But the truth is, end of verse 15, they were detestable in the sight of God. Because they did love money. And they didn't love God. And they did not obey Moses and the prophets. So once again, this story that Jesus tells is actually directed at these Pharisees. The hero in, in their minds in this story is the rich man because he is the symbol of God-blessed life in Israel. On the other hand, they would treat the poor man, the destitute man, the same way the rich man did. For they were famous for having contempt for such people. They thought that, you know, he was cursed. And so they would leave him alone. And the Pharisees also believed in life after death. They also believed in judgment, and they believed in heaven. The Sadducees didn't believe in heaven, and the Pharisees did believe in hell. But none of them expected to go there, and, and that was the problem that they had. So the Lord tells them a story that truthfully will expose them, again, as many of his stories did, and they are like the rich men, self-satisfied, self-indulgent, lovers of money. They despised the outcast, they rejected the truth of the scriptures, just like the rich man in the story. Well, it's obvious that the story is an assault on the false religion of the Pharisaic Judaism, but it's also a compassionate, merciful warning, not only to the Pharisees, not only to those who follow that religion, but it's a warning to us as well. Uh, you know, because there is a place of torment. Now, before we get into the story, that we need to make a point of clarification. The question often comes up in regard to whether or not this is an actual historical account or a parable. And I've asked several people in this congregation what they thought. And 50-50. Some think it's a parable, some think it's an actual account. 
Well, may I be so bold as to say there would be no reason to consider it anything other than a parable except for the minor detail, and that is the fact that somebody in the story has a name, which is a little odd for parables. But you know, there are no rules for names given concerning parables. But all the elements of the story would lead lend to the idea that it is a parable. It's introduced, for example, in the way that parables are regularly introduced. Now there was a certain rich man. That's very typical of the introduction of the parables. It's the same introduction at least six times in the Gospel of Luke. And it's a story intended to illustrate a spiritual truth, and the main character, the rich man, has no name. Furthermore, the circumstances are fictional. They're imaginary. For example, seeing into heaven from hell, that has to be imaginary. From hell, talking to Abraham who's in heaven, no one can actually do that. So there are many reasons to think that this is simply a story that Jesus invented to make a spiritual point in which he decides to name one of the characters and Jesus gives him the name Lazarus, which of course is, is a good name. It's Eleazar, which means he's blessed by God. And one who God helps, and of course in the story Lazarus does receive the greatest help from God, and that is salvation and access to heaven. And perhaps Lazarus is given a name simply to distinguish him from a nondescript rich man, because no one in hell needs a name. They don't need a name, because there's no fellowship in hell. They're in total isolation. There's no relationships there. But everyone in heaven has a name. A name written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Now, I fully realize that there are many biblical scholars who would say that this is an actual account. And it could be. I don't think it is, but it could be. And I won't stake my life on the thought that it is a parable. And I will not be like the late, great J. Vernon McGee who would say, My beloved, there's a lot of fine men who take the position, that position, but if you want to believe what is right, you'll believe me. I won't say that. I won't even go near that far. One commentator put it this way. The important thing is that whether the story is the true incident or a parable, the teaching behind it remains the same. Even if it's not a real story, it's realistic. Parable or not, Jesus plainly uses this story to teach that after death, the unsaved are eternally separated from God, that they remember their rejection of the gospel, they are in torment, and that their condition cannot be undone. So whether parable or literal account, Jesus clearly taught the existence of heaven and hell. Well, so much for the overview. The story breaks into three parts. Life, death, life after death. Life, death, life after death. Let's look at life first. Verse 19 of Luke chapter 16. Now there was a rich man. And by the way, our Lord paints these extreme images. They are really, really extreme. And they are unforgettable. And they're vivid. There was a rich man... And he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. That is to say, he didn't wear anything but the absolute finest. The most expensive garments. Purple very often came from shellfish. And this is the purple dye that was used to give lavish color to the garments of those who were wealthy. In Acts chapter 16, we're told of a woman named Lydia and who was a seller of purple garment. It was very expensive. And then, the fine linen would refer to an Egyptian cotton. And this would be like the Giza cotton that Mike Lindell from My Pillow talks about in his commercial, the, uh, a cotton that's grown in the region between the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean Sea and the Nile River. Very exquisite cotton. But anyway... This is just to show that the regular daily habit of this man was to dress to the max and his regular custom was to live life in the very lavish way so that he could put himself on display. 
He wanted everybody to know that he was wealthy. And he was. Now we have to understand that the Pharisees that are listening to this, they're saying to themselves, oh man, this man, this man's blessed. He's blessed. Blessed is this man because Again, they were the original inventors of the prosperity gospel. If you're rich, God made you rich. If you're poor, God made you poor. If you're rich, you're blessed. If you're poor, you're cursed. That was their simple theology. And if anything went wrong in your life, it's because you are being cursed. You've sinned. So the Pharisees would say, this rich man, he's our guy. This is us. And again, Jesus said in verse 14, the Pharisees were lovers of money and they were good at showing off their wealth. So this very indulgent, luxurious picture of a rich man with whom the Pharisees would identify with and conclude that he was blessed by God. On the other hand, verse 20, a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. This is completely the extreme Extreme poverty. Poor indicates this guy had absolutely nothing. I mean, he was destitute. He's covered with sores. The Greek term for sores is what is what the word that in English we get the word ulcer from. And we would say he had oozing ulcers all over his body gross, filthy, dirty, unkept, with oozing pus over his entire form. Apparently also he suffered from some kind of crippling disability because the language Jesus uses is explicit. Lazarus was laid at the rich man's gate. And the Greek word for that is dumped, not a delicate word which indicates that this is a beggar of the most tragic kind just dumped at the rich man's gate and Jesus in the story doesn't tell us who dumped him there. But this would naturally be one of the two places that beggars would go. Another place would be at the temple, at the gate, so they could beg. But in the story here, the poor, pathetic, pitiful beggar has been dumped at this large gate at the entrance to the rich man's estate. And he's been dumped there so that he can beg from the rich man. Because the rich man would have plenty to provide for such a desperate, hopeless, needy person. And so we meet the two characters that begin the story. Rich man, like the Pharisees, consumed with unrighteousness, unrighteous wealth, loving money, serving money, not God, and therefore detestable to God. The rich man in the story gives the poor man no help, absolutely no help. Does he know about him? Absolutely he knows about him. He's at his gate. So every time the rich man goes out and comes in, he sees him there. Because the poor man cannot move, so he's stuck there. Thus the rich man knows this poor man has many needs. Now, look at verse 21. This poor man named Lazarus laid at his gate covered with sores, verse 21, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Now this is really an interesting setting. There have been those who have studied the ordinary customs of dinners at rich people's estates in those days. And guests at a meal would use the broken pieces of bread to wipe their hands. You know, when they were eating, they would, you know, dip their hands and, you know, with no utensils, they just eat with their hands. They'd dip their hands in maybe oil, like olive oil or something like that. And then they would take bits of pieces of bread and start wiping hands so they could absorb the stuff. And after they got done wiping their hands, they would throw these bits of bread under the table. And then dogs hung around because this would be an open area. And so they would come in and eat those pieces of bread. The point is, And that the rich man wouldn't even consider giving the dirty bread lying on the floor eaten by dogs to this beggar. And the Pharisees would understand that. They would identify with that because they would agree that they would think that this is a curse of God on this man and they don't want to have anything to do with him. 
So the rich man says, I want to keep my distance from him because if I do, I might be going against the purposes of God. So the poor man is left at the gate, not even given an opportunity to eat the dirty bread that's thrown under the table. And add to that, end of verse 21, and this is gross. Even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. This is the ultimate indignity. We think about dogs, we think about man's best friend. But in those days, dogs were no pets. The worst thing you could call someone was a dog. And in those days, if you were a Gentile dog, you would be compared to a pariah-like mongrel that roamed the outskirts of town in search of garbage. And these pariah-like mongrels did not come to lick the wounds, but they came to actually eat the wounds. They came to chew on the oozing flesh. How more humiliating can one person be? We're talking about an utterly destitute, hopeless person. He would be regarded as less than human. He would be the epitome of destitution. Unclean through and through, an outcast cursed by God. And the rich man, the poor guy, this poor guy is nothing more than roadkill to him. And the Pharisees can totally identify with that. Yes, sir, this man is under the curse of God. Well, then an event happens to both of them that changes everything, and that's death. Verse 22. Now, the poor man died. Now, at this point, if Jesus just pauses and doesn't continue what he's going to say, the Pharisees would say, yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah, God's curse is now complete. He's dead and he's going to hell. But Jesus says the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. What? I mean, <laughs> this has to be a shocker. This is a bomb that explodes in the middle of their minds. It's not surprising that the diseased, destitute, starving men chewed by filthy, filthy diseased dogs would then endure the final of death and, and die. And by the way, nothing is said about a funeral. Nothing is said about a burial. There wouldn't have been any because if he was in Jerusalem, his body would have been taken by the garbage collectors in the city dumped and dumped out in Gehenna, the ever-burning trash dump of Jerusalem, which is the symbol of hell, and he would have been burned like garbage. No funeral because he would have been viewed by all as cursed by God and thus unworthy of a funeral. But there was something better than a funeral. He was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. You know, yeah, they had a funeral for him. Sure, he was a rich man. He's respected. He's surrounded by people who lift him up, give him due respect. The rich man died, as all men do. Latest statistics show that, that one out of one people die. Proper funeral is held for him while the poor man is simply dumped in a garbage heap. Now, the thinking of the Pharisees says this is an open and shut deal. If the poor man goes to hell, the rich man goes to heaven. But the shock of the story is that the angels carry away the poor man into Abraham's bosoms, and that introduces us to life after death. What happens to the rich man? Verse 23. In Hades. Say what? In Hades. He lifted up his eyes. Being in torment. Wow, this is a complete stunner. This is the absolute opposite of what they would have expected. This is the great reversal of everything. The poor man dies, carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Language that expresses the fact that God sends his own holy angels to gather one of his own into glory. This is terribly upsetting to the comfortable, simplistic theology of the Pharisees. If you suffer in life, you're cursed by God. If you're rich, you're blessed by God. 
Now, what does it mean to be taken in Abraham's bosom? Well, this is the only time it's ever used in Scripture. It's kind of an odd term, actually. And probably the better way to understand it is if you, you sort of take it out in its ancient sense, the poor man went to where Abraham was. That's all it means. And the Jews know one thing for sure. Abraham is not in hell. That they know. Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Genesis chapter 15. Abraham is a friend of God. They know where Abraham is. And Abraham is in heaven. Abraham is not in hell. And what happened is that this, the man, this man assumed to be cursed goes to the right place, right to the place where Abraham is. And the idea of saying Abraham's bosom, Abraham's chest, or Abraham's spread, it's just to say he went to be with Abraham and he has a personal, intimate relationship with Abraham, fellowshipping with Abraham in the glories of heaven. And this would be a big deal. This would be the greatest of all Jewish heroes. And you see, when the Jews wanted to defend their privilege, when they wanted to defend their uniqueness, if you will, when they wanted to defend their place with God there and their hope and their promise, they would say, we are the children of Abraham. Well, this poor man named Lazarus went to sit close to the host Abraham he went to feast with Abraham and became the guest of honor. And this is just another one of those outrageous stories that Jesus tells that just blasts the sensibilities and the theology of the Pharisees. How can a man in this world have so little, who was so bad, who was so desperate, who was so being cursed, become the guest of honor in heaven at the salvation banquet? He's gone to the highest place of privilege. What an extreme reversal. On the other hand, the rich man is in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. The poor man died, went to heaven, and I follow this, and he is fully conscious of where he's at. And the rich man is fully conscious of where he's at. This is not soul sleep. It's, and in the New Testament, Hades always refers to the abode of the, of the damned, never the believers. It's only used, of Hades, or the only, Hades is only used a couple times in the books of Acts where it's referring to Old Testament usage of the word. And the Old Testament is more general. It's therefore really a synonym for hell. And the rich man had had it all his life, he goes to hell, and he's there immediately. And this is a very important phrase. He lifted up his eyes. He's conscious. He knows where he's at. He is in hell. And what's his experience? Middle of verse 33, being in torment. Literally, being in torments, plural. Not one, but many. Coming at him from every conceivable angle. This is fully informed conscience is without restraint accusing of every evil ever committed by him. Every act of rejection of the truth ever committed. That torment is coming at him. All those accusations would come at full force for the rest of eternity. And some of the torments that Jesus himself has described about hell is outer darkness. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Horrific, horrendous, horrifying suffering. And the absolute opposite is for the believer. And when the believer dies immediately, immediately, he or she is in the conscious fellowship and joys of the heavenly experience. And then our Lord crafts an imaginary conversation. It comes at the end of verse 23. The rich man being in torments. 
saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And that's why I think this is a fictional story. People in hell can't see people in heaven. For the sake of illustration, though, the tormented rich man in the story is allowed to look out of hell into heaven across that impassable gulf for the sake of the point. Though in reality, souls in hell have no access to heaven. Souls in heaven have no intrusion from the eyes, in, the eyes of, uh, in the eyes of hell. It's purely a parable, in my opinion. But for the sake of illustration, to help us understand and that he understands what he's going through, and thus he's allowed in the story to understand what Lazarus is experiencing. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Can you just hear him saying that? And you see the Father Abraham thing that, you know, that Jews, especially Pharisees, would all identify with that. Father Abraham, wait a minute, I'm a Jew. You're my father. I'm a child of Abraham. And every Jew knows that Abraham is the model of hospitality. And so this rich Jewish man just pleads in his story both to the hospitality of Abraham as well as the responsibility of Abraham to take care of one of his children. Have mercy on me. Interesting. The merciless one now wants mercy. He requests for himself from Abraham what he was never willing to give the man who was requested it from him. And this is really bizarre. Have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. You know what, this man is so ingrained with the idea that he is superior to Lazarus that even though he's in hell and Lazarus is in heaven, he thinks the low lives like Lazarus should still serve him. Even in hell. Which is to say this about hell. It's not corrective. It doesn't correct anyone. It doesn't fix anyone. It only punishes Send Lazarus. Now the rich man needs and wants what Lazarus has. The rich man wouldn't give it and Lazarus can't. And you see there is no repentance here. There's no remorse here. There's no seeking forgiveness. There's no humility here. Again, hell is not corrective. It just crystallizes into permanency the wretchedness of the sinner without any relief whatsoever. Forever. And ever, and ever. But the rich man still sees himself as one to be served by the Lord. He sent Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue. And this is obviously a metaphor. There's no water in hell. There's no H2 couldn't, and no H2, H2O could re relieve the torment of hell anyway. But the, and this is the point. This is the good indication of the horrors of hell. Because it doesn't say, could you send Lazarus down with a bucket? Or perhaps maybe you could just get a hose and drop it over and so that I could just, the gravity can send down a constant stream to hell. It's not that. It's just a drip. A drip off the tip of his finger. The souls of the damned suffer so profoundly that one tiny dip of water would bring immense relief. It would mean everything to them, but it never comes. I'm in agony. I'm in this flame. I'm, I, 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 I'm in agonizing pain. And you know what? Water couldn't soothe an eternally tortured soul. But this is a terrifying image of hell. No relief, no let up. The condemned, unredeemed sinner forever and ever and ever will never get out, get one ounce of reprieve. None. Of the countless tortures, plural, of burning hell. 
Well, Abraham responds in this imaginary conversation. Verse 25, Abraham said, child. Now, I think Jesus said that on purpose. You know, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't help himself here. <laughs> yeah, the rich man is a child of Abraham in a genetic sense, in a gene- genealogical sense, racial sense. Child. You are a child of mine. You're a son. You're a descendant physically. And you know, even by saying this, Jesus shows the compassion to the Jews. I mean, he, that's, and it was always part of what Jesus was saying was to warn them, warning to these self-righteous Jews who were listening to them, and it's also a warning to us as we read the penetrating story, and that's the purpose of it. Child, remember that during your life you received your good things. That's what we call common grace. The world is full of riches because the creator God put them there. He gave all of us things to richly enjoy, and that's what common grace is. It's the sovereign grace of God bestowed upon all of mankind, regardless of whether or not they are elected for salvation or not. In other words, God has always bestowed his graciousness on all people in all parts of the earth at all times. Psalm 145, verse 9, the psalmist says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus himself said, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But this man, this very wealthy man, having received those common grace blessings, simply indulged himself. And like the earlier man that is presented by Luke in the Gospels, built bigger barns to store his stuff. And he followed, you know, the thing, eat, drink, and be merry. You had your stuff in that life. You received good things and Lazarus bad things. In other words... May I say this? He had his best life now. Right? That's as good as it's going to get. And life can be that way. The unregenerate can die filthy rich and the regenerate can die filthy poor. And here's this rich man in hell. And all the components of common grace are not there. Why? Because God's not there. There's no common grace in hell. Now, Jesus does not tell us how Lazarus winds up the way he did with absolutely nothing, and and we can assume that he must have had some kind of disability, some kind of dreadful disability that caused him to be dumped at the gate. But the picture is that Lazarus had a hard life, but he's in a different world. He's being comforted because the angels brought him to glory. He's in the fellowship of the father of the faithful. The rich man is in agony. And so Abraham says, rich man, what Lazarus was temporarily, you are eternally miserable. What you did not provide Lazarus when you could have, he cannot provide for you, and it's never, ever going to change. Ever. Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed. It is set fast. It is permanent. It is stand, it will stand forever. There's this great chasm fix so that those who wish to come over from here will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. And this is really a, a, a legitimate, devastating point. When one is in hell, that's it. He will never be able to go to heaven. And conversely, when one is heaven, he will never go to hell because it's fixed. In hell, there's no relief, there's no hope. Well, the rich man in the story is not finished. He does have general compassion for his family. He knows his fate is fixed. He's in eternal agony, and he knows it. But he has one more request. Verse 27. And he said then, and that word then means okay. Okay. Then I beg you. 
you know, the, you know, I know I'm going to be here forever. No hope for me. Then I beg you. And he's not asking God. He's asking uh, in the conversation. He's asking Father Abraham. Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to the place of torment. And I guess we could say that if this guy had any kind of positive asset to him, that it was he cared about his brothers. And in the story, Jesus emphasizes that his five brothers were just like him. He's in hell and they're on their way to hell. Now, just to make a point again, hell's not corrective. It's punitive. And the request, in a sense, is kind of a complaint. You know, the rich man still has a condescending attitude toward Lazarus because, again, he says, send him. If you won't send him to bring me a drop of water, send him to my brothers. And even though Lazarus is carried away by angels to glory and is in close, intimate relationship with Abraham, the rich man still has this contempt and disdain for Lazarus. And the reason that Jesus is telling this story and he's using the request from the rich man is because the rich man's brothers are just like him and just like the Pharisees who are listening to this. They're super religious. They totally bought into the Pharisaic Judaism. They think they're going to heaven because they think they have been blessed by God. But the reality is they are on their way to hell. And so this is a compassionate warning. So the rich man, very concerned about his brothers, are going to end up just like him in hell. And what he's really saying is this. Look, my brothers don't have enough information about hell. You know, that's the problem. If I knew what I know now, I wouldn't come here. Oh, really? (laughs) So could you please send Lazarus to tell my five brothers what's here so they won't come? I I I want Lazarus to warn them so that they won't come to this place of torment. And you see, again, there is no repentance here. And there's no repentance because there's God is not there. The Holy Spirit is not there. Repentance is impossible. But Jesus creates this concern to get the point of the whole story. Why do people go to hell? Why did the rich man go to hell? Why would his brothers go to hell? To hell. Here comes the answer, verse 29. Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. You know what their problem was? They didn't listen to what? They didn't listen to Scripture. They didn't listen to the Word of God. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them listen to them. Let them heed them. Let them understand them. And that's exactly what they would not do. Jesus said that again and again. In Matthew chapter 15, and I won't have you turn there, 13, I won't have you turn there, but just listen to what he says. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of the people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear, and they've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return. They have Moses and the prophets. That was enough. And that's simply referring to the Old Testament. What could they have learned from the Old Testament? Everything. Everything they needed to know about the nature of the one true living eternal God. From the Old Testament, they would, have ample, they would have had ample and sufficient information about their own sinfulness and their need for repentance. 
From the Old Testament, they would have had the truth concerning salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and justification that comes by grace through faith. From the Old Testament, they would have known that God offers complete forgiveness of skin, sin and escape from judgment and the wrath that comes from that judgment and condemnation. They would have understood even from the Old Testament that righteousness comes from God is imputed to those who put their trust in him. They would have understood from the Old Testament that substitution is the way God deals with sin. And they would have understood if they had believed the Old Testament that there was coming a sacrifice, a sufficient sacrifice, that there was coming a Savior who would crush the head of Satan, who would provide redemption for his people, who would be the suffering substitute, who would then establish his throne, bring fulfillment to all of the unconditional promises given to Abraham and David and to all Israel and to all the world. And finally, they would have understood that they had to repent and believe. They would have to understood that the need for total abandonment, forsaking all other hopes, all other gods, other, all other religious stuff, all other self-reliant stuff, and come to the one true living God. And if they had truly believed the Moses and the prophets, they would have known that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Well, the rich man gets a little argumentative. Verse 30. But he said, no, Father Abraham. <laughs> no, no, Father Abraham, you're wrong. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Scripture's not enough, Father Abraham. I had Moses and the prophets and I'm in hell. And guess what? The Pharisees have Moses and the prophets, and where are they headed? They're headed for hell. And that's the point of the story. And so Jesus is saying, if someone will, you know, if the, and they said, if someone will rise from the dead, that would be a powerful sign. And that would indicate in the minds of the people listening to the story that the brothers also knew Lazarus. And wow, if Lazarus, whom they knew to be that wretched beggar, comes back and they recognize the same guy who was there at the gate and he can tell them that he has been to hell and back and warn them and the brothers then would certainly avoid going to hell. The problem with that is you can't avoid hell by just not wanting to go there. The only way to avoid hell is by following the path of salvation revealed in Moses and the prophets, revealed in the scriptures. So Abraham says this to the rich man in hell. Verse 31, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Now think about that. Was that true? Who rose from the dead? Jesus did. Do they believe? No, no. In fact, in, in an interesting divine coincidence, if I can call it that, but there was a real Lazarus who Jesus raised from the dead. And all these Jewish rulers knew that. And that motivated them even more to want to kill Jesus, to have him arrested, to have him out of there. Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 13. I'm sorry, chapter 12. John chapter 12. I want us to look at the words of Jesus 
starting with verse 46 of John chapter 12. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings as one who judges him, the word I spoke is what will judge him the last day. Did you get that? If you reject what Jesus Christ said, that will be the judge in the last day. Every person damned to eternal hell is going to be damned to eternal hell by the word, by the truth of the word, which will render its judgment on all those who refuse to believe it. And the underlying point of what we've covered this evening, that is hell is not in any way to be minimized. Let me say it again. Hell is not in any way to be minimized. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31, it says, For we know him, referring to God himself. We know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. How does one escape hell? How does one escape that terrifying judgment How does one enter heaven? By believing the soul-saving gospel revealed in the word of God. That is that we are all sinners on our way to hell. God in his matchless grace has offered to us his son who paid the penalty that we deserved to take on the full wrath of God for our sin, for payment for our sin. The only way one will ever escape hell is knowing that gospel message and receiving that message and knowing that there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And that's the glorious name of Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God and if one repents from sin and trusts in the personal work of Christ and him and him alone if one puts his faith in him he will be redeemed regenerated, renewed and given new life. Not only new life on this earth, but new life in the glories of heaven forever and ever. So question, where will you spend eternity? Will you spend eternity in a place of horrendous torment where just a drop of water on the tongue would be oh so refreshing? Or would you spend eternity in the glories of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ did, kneeling at his feet, praising him, and where there's nothing but constant and continuous joy and rejoicing? Father in heaven,
How rich is this story? And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here tonight, someone listening, someone viewing, that has not yet turned from their sin and humbly placed their faith in what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross, bearing the punishment of their sin, receiving him, receiving what he did. Pray that if one hasn't done that, that you will your spirit will just help them to understand that and to give in. And we pray these things in the name of the one who did come and die for us and rose again to give us eternal life. Amen.